afternoon. We're so delighted that you have chosen to spend a few minutes here at the Umatilla Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, and uh, to hear Dr. Minder and to uh, learn a little bit about our amazing eyes. They are amazing, aren't they? We are blessed to have amazing eyes. So we're, uh, uh, just, just briefly, I'd love to know how did you find out about the seminar? Did anyone get the flyer at church? Maybe you were at church. So quite a few people got flyers from church. Did anyone come because they heard it advertised on the radio on W91.5? Excellent, wonderful. Uh, did anyone come some other way? You saw it in the newspaper. Did anyone see it in the paper? Awesome, wonderful. So uh, any other way? You were invited by a friend. Email. email, an email. You were invited by a friend. That's awesome. So for one, somehow or another, you're here. And we're delighted that you're here. And uh, now just, uh, I pastor two churches. And the other church that I pastor is in Apopka. It's the Plymouth Sorrento Church. It's on Pumpkin Road. And next, uh, next Saturday, uh, we have a speaker. Now, there's some of these little flyers. It's called God's Plan of Healing, God's Health Plan. Learn uh, Natural Healing Skills. And it's a, uh, there's two seminars. One is a three-day seminar, and that's on one side of this flyer. And on the other side of the flyer, it's this, it, there's a afternoon. Uh, he's having a message in the morning at church, and then in the afternoon from 2 to 6, he's doing uh, all about natural for all different types of health issues. So that's something that there's some flyers on the table out there. You're welcome to grab one. If, you, if they're all gone, let me know and I can get the information to you. The other thing is we're going to have you, uh, we're going to get your register. We're going to send this little paper around. If you'd like to fill it out, we're going to have a draw for a couple of books at the end and um, on health. And, uh, and then also, uh, if you're interested in any types of programs, because we're going to be having a plant-based cooking school in the new year. Uh, we do programs like Diabetes Undone, how to reverse diabetes through lifestyle, and, uh, and all different types of health, uh, preventive and chronic disease reversal uh, programs through uh, natural therapies and that kind of thing, through natural health. So I'm going to be handing these out during the program, and if you want to fill it out, we'll do a draw at the end, and then uh, give you um, a book. Uh, so at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, briefly uh, Dr. Minner. I'm going to have him spe speak a little bit more about um, what he does. Uh, but uh, he's been a friend for many, many years in Canada. He's uh, practices in uh, Kingston, Ontario. I was happen to be born in Kingston, Ontario, which he just found out about today. <laughs> uh, but I'm good friends with his mother and his uh, two brothers and their families. And, uh, and when he was coming down to Florida uh, with his family, he said, hey, you know, they had visited about a number of years ago, around seven or eight years ago here, and uh, said, if you'd like, I could do a seminar in the afternoon on eye health, the amazing eye, because he's a real believer in seeing the amazing handiwork of God and his creative power in the eye. And maybe you can speak a little bit about that, because that's, that's incredible. But we're delighted that you're here. Uh, and uh, you can tell us a little bit about your training. I was trained in the United States and then went back to practice in Canada. Uh, he's got a dear wife, Christina, is here, and four children. Two of them are in college in California and, and two are going to school in Canada. I think homeschooled. I think they're homeschooled. Not anymore. Not anymore. They were homeschooled earlier, but now they're in uh, regular school. And uh, we are delighted, uh, Dr. Marcus. Minder for your uh, giving up a beautiful relaxing vacation day for us. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Pat. Let's let's pray. Let's pray. Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the uh, beautiful opportunity to learn about our eyes and how to take care of them and, and the common eye problems. And uh, Lord, we are so thankful that we have eyes. I know that there's one dear soul here that is blind. And uh, maybe there's a, a one who's got, um, is legally blind, can see a little bit. And uh, I know that they would both say that uh, that 
they're looking forward to the day when you will uh, give us new eyes. You at the resurrection, you, uh, or at your soon coming, you will give us brand new eyes. They will be perfect. But in the meantime, Lord, we've got to take care of these eyes. So thank you for the knowledge that you are going to share through your servant now. So bless the presentation. Bless Dr. Minder, we pray, and his family too. Amen. Amen. there Pastor Putt. Uh, like he said, uh, I've known Pastor Putt or the Putt family for a number of years um, as he was the pastor at Richmond Hill and, uh, in Ontario and our paths crossed again when he was uh, moved to Belleville and Madoc and that was close to my area so he's just been wonderful uh, visiting with him today and, and his family and his son and uh, his wife. It's just great to be here and as he said, like I think I believe that, you know, bo that God created us and our bodies are amazingly and wonderfully made. David says in, uh, in the book, in the Bible, he says that, Behold, I am wonderfully made. And as you look at any part of the body, that is the case. But the eye is really a special, special organ that has incredible capabilities. You know, about 80% um, of the information you take in is coming in through your eyes. 80%. And so for, so for somebody who's visually impaired or blind, their, life, their lives are very different. It's a lot harder because they've, they've got to gather their information from their other senses, right? So the eye is, is truly amazing. I have here some gifts. I'll tell you more about them at the end. So I'm going to be giving you some statistics. We're going to be talking about the eye, some interesting facts. We won't make it too difficult. And then at the end I'll have some questions. And if you can answer the question, I have a, a gift for you. And these can be very helpful. Even when I tell patients to do it, they, they're kind of like, well, I don't know. But then I hear back from them and say, oh, that helped out my problem so much. And maybe you might have that problem. So please, um, don't be afraid to answer, try and answer the question for these gifts. I've I, I got a few here that I can give out, okay? And we'll talk more about it at the end of the presentation when I ask my questions. So hopefully you'll, you'll get, you know, from what I'm saying, you'll get some of the facts and then I will ask questions based on, on the presentation that I'm going to make here today. I'm so thankful that you guys all decided to come out this afternoon and uh, hear this presentation. I'm a little bit surprised so many came out. Uh, I'm really happy that, that you guys decided to come and hear this, uh, this presentation. And I pray that you're going to be blessed by the information that I share here today. Okay, to start off with, let's start off with just anatomy. And um, here's an eyeball. Does anybody know how long your eyeball is, roughly? It's about an inch. For those in the metric system, about 2.54 centimeters. That's how long the eye is. Okay? But it does wonderful work. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the eye. I thank goodness I got a pointer here. Okay? Sometimes people get the terms mixed up in terms of what the eye anatomy is. It happens all the time. The outer part, like what a contact lens would sit on. You know, sometimes people wear contact lenses to help them see. It goes on the outer part. It's a clear tissue right here. It's called the cornea. Right behind the cornea, there's a liquid called the aqueous humor, and then right behind that is the colored part of the eye. The colored part of the eye is called the iris, okay? And then right behind the iris, most people don't even realize it, there's another optical refracting aspect to the eye called the lens. Now, a lot of people want to call the front part of the eye the lens, but it's not. It's called the cornea. Then right behind it, we have the lens, okay? And then the, where the light focuses, the light comes in here, goes through the pupil, through the center of the iris, through the lens, and then it focuses right back here on the macula. Okay, maybe you've heard of macular degeneration. Yeah, I'm sure you have, especially in Florida. And, uh, well, it's just the way it is. And so here we've got the macula, which is critical, okay? Now, your macula is the central part of the retina where the light focuses, okay? And if you don't have your macula, or if it's damaged or it's gone, you're legally blind. Okay, because it's only the macula that has the ability to see 20-20 or to see things of detail. So whenever you read something, either at a distance or up close, if you're reading something, you're trying to reprint only, excuse me, only the macula can read that detail. See how small it is? It's a very small part of the retina. All the rest of the retina, this yellow, cannot read detail or very poorly, okay? It can see things. I can see my fingers wiggling over here, but if you held up a piece of paper for me to read over here, I can't read it. 
Because only the macula can see it. So I have to look directly at it with the center of my retina in order to read something. This, you know, to read something. You've got to look directly at it. I mean, think about it. If you go to read a sign, you have to look right at it to read it. You can't use your peripheral vision to read it. You might see that the hands are moving, but you, I can't read what's written on my hand over here. I have to look right at it. Okay? So that's, you know, that's the critical part that allows you to read detail. So if you lose your macula, you're, you're visually impaired. You're le you could be legally blind. And macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness over the age of 65 in America and Canada. The leading cause of blindness under the age of 65 is diabetes. Okay? And I'll talk more about diseases of the eye later. First we're just going to touch on anatomy and then we're going to touch on uh, how light focuses in the eye. So here we have you know, the eye, the light comes in and it focuses on the back of the eye. And then this yellow area here is called the retina. The light that touches the retina stimulates the retina and it sends the signal to the brain through the optic nerve. Okay? The optic nerve then goes to the brain to bring that information. Okay, so next, um, I, think, I think that's all we need to know for the, oh, for the anatomy. Um, I want to say one more thing about, about the eye, and that is the eyeball. You ever take a magnifying glass and like, you know, start a fire that way? You remember doing that as a kid, right? You take a magnifying glass and you focus it. Ooh, you can start a fire, right? Or burn something. So, you know, those magnifying glasses, maybe they're like, you know, four or five diopters. The power of the eye, are you ready for this? Is approximately 60 diopters. Okay, a diopter is simply a measurement of uh, focusing light. So sometimes, let's say you went through your whole life, didn't need glasses, and then you started to need glasses when you get older. I'm in that boat too. You might need like a plus two. Maybe you've seen them at like the dollar store or the drugstore, right? So that's a, that's a plus two. The eye power, the whole total eye power, is about 60 diopters. Okay, so plus two will focus a lot. If you have, hold a lens that's two diopters, 50 centimeters away from, from, from a target here, it'll focus it, okay? It's just a matter of measuring a focusing of light. Okay? So the eye has 60 diopters, which is pretty high power of focusing. Incidentally, the 60 diopters doesn't come from just one thing. It comes from the cornea. Okay? The cornea gives us 45 diopters, give or take a few diopters. And the lens gets about 15, roughly 15 diopters. So 15 plus 45 is 60 diopters for that eye that's about an inch long. Okay? So light comes in, it focuses on the back of the eye, and you know that the eye is like a pinhole camera. And if you know anything about pinhole cameras, when the light comes into the eye, what happens to the image that is focused on the back of the eye? Does anybody know? It's upside down. Okay? So your brain, when the information comes into your eye and it lands on the back of the eye here, the image is upside down. So when the information gets sent to your brain, it has to turn it around. Otherwise you'd see everything upside down. Now here is one of the most amazing things and it shows you the plasticity of the brain. If you were to put on glasses that make the world upside down, in a short period of time, it might take a couple days, your brain will invert the image. Can you believe that? So if you're walking around, you know, with your head upside down, after a while, if you kept it that way, your brain could invert the image so you would see it properly. Right? That's just amazing. That's amazing capabilities that the brain has and the eye has. Okay. So let's talk about the, these common terms that people hear. The first one is, it's not a common term, but the term is called emetropia. Okay? Emetropia. All that means is that your eyes are perfect at a distance. So when you look at something at a distance, you don't need glasses. You can see 20-20. Okay? That means that you can see fine. 2020 just means that you can see a certain size letter at 20 feet. It's a prescribed size of a letter and that means that you can see it, which is pretty small. Most people, most people with their glasses can see 2020 at a distance unless you've got some kind of eye disease, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But when you don't need glasses and you see 2020, that's called emetropia. Okay? I know it's not a common word, but let's go to the next one. You've heard of this one before. You've ever heard of nearsightedness? Yeah. So nearsightedness, the true term for nearsightedness is called myopia. And, you know, I'm not going to plague you with all these terms, but myopia just means nearsighted. So instead of the light, you know, when the light comes in, it's got to focus on the macula, which is back here, on the back of the eye, the retina. Okay? So remember, the macula is just the name of the center of the retina, where, the, where you read detail. But the whole retina, the light focuses back here. 
If the light is coming in and it's misfocused and it's not focusing on the retina, if you're nearsighted, the light is focusing in front of it and it means that things are blurry at a distance. That's what nearsightedness means. The true term is myopia though. So anyways, if the light is focusing here, the image is going to be fuzzy. So if you're trying to look at something at a distance and you're nearsighted or myopic, it's fuzzy at a distance. Okay? But people who are nearsighted without their glasses on usually see well up close. That's what nearsightedness means. It means that near, without glasses, you can see well. And I'm sure there's some of you that uh, are in that boat. The other one is farsightedness. Okay, oh, the myopia, yeah. So basically, one of the reasons why you might be nearsighted is if the eye is a little bit longer. So here's somebody who's emetropic. They're not myopic. Their light is focusing where it should, right on the center at the back of the eye in the fovea. <clears throat> but if your eye is a little elongated, you see how this eyeball is longer? If your eye is just a little bit longer, it'll make you nearsighted. This is a high myopia. This is focusing quite in front of the retina here. Okay? And so, just to give you an idea of how finely tuned your eyes are. So let's think you, you don't need glasses at a distance. You see well. That's great. If the length of the eye is only increased in length by one millimeter, I'm sorry it's metric. I don't know what that is in 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 inches, it's just a fraction of an inch. Okay, a millimeter is really small. If one millimeter, if your eye is longer in one millimeter than it should be for the curvature of the front part of the eye, you will be a three diopter myope. Three diopters is kind of up there. That's a pretty strong prescription. You need your glasses to drive. You need your glasses to see at a distance. So that's how finely tuned the eye is. And in fact, even in the scientific world, they know there's this process called emetropization, which means that when you come out of the womb and a baby, your eye is actually trying to have no prescription. In other words, the body will try and lengthen the eye or change some attribute of the eye so that when you look at a distance, you'll have 20-20 vision. Okay? So God has put that in our genes so that the eye is trying to make it so that you don't have to need glasses to see at a distance. Okay, and that's called emetropization. It's an amazing feat that God has put, and it's in our genes. Now, we live in a sinful world, right? That people, we die, we get diseases, things, problems happen. And I think that probably the genetics have been, you know, messed up in people who have high amounts of nearsightedness. And, you know, even what you eat can affect your genes. I don't know if you know that, but what you eat can even affect your genes. You know, we can talk more about that maybe afterwards. That's not the topic of this presentation. And so anyways, genetics, if they get damaged, then you might lose that ability for your eye to have no prescription at a distance. Okay? So that's myopia. Next we're going to go, oh, so if you're myopic, you need one of these kind of lenses here. You need like a concave, like a cave. You see how it's like a cave on this side? And so if you're highly myopic, you might need a minus 10. That's a really high prescription. Now, I've seen people who have minus 20, and that's like not very common. But this is quite a high prescription. These are thick glasses. Now, today, because of technology, they can make the glasses quite thin. But I remember back in the 80s, I mean, some kids in school would have really thick glasses, and I really feel bad that they had to, you know, to deal with them. Today, they can make the glasses much thinner, which is great. But if you're highly myopic, you need a lens that looks like this to defocus the light back down to the back of the eye, the retina there. Hyperopia, that's the opposite. So basically... The eye is maybe a little bit too short, and so the light is focusing, is trying to focus behind the eye, but it can't focus through past the eye, so it just leaves a blur here on the retina. And uh, if you're farsighted, um, basically, usually, farsighted people see better at a distance than they do up close. But the true term is hyperopic or hyperopia. Now, if you are hyperopic, you're going to need a plus lens to bring the focus back here, which is wanting to be behind the retina, to bring it up to the retina. Okay, so you need a plus lens or a convex lens, okay? And sometimes if you talk with somebody and you see they have glasses on, it makes your eyes look bigger. That's a plus lens and they're probably hyperopic. So I usually when I speak to somebody, I know right away what their eyes are by simply looking at their glasses, I can usually tell. And, you know, most optometrists can do that. That's pretty obvious to them. So here's hyperopia again. You see this picture of the apple here? It comes in through the eye and then it gets inverted. It actually doesn't invert there. It's more like around here. But it inverts and so the image is upside down. 
And because this is trying to focus behind the eye, it's blurry, you put a plus lens in front of it, and zoop, it brings the focus right up to the retina. So, you know, when you go see the optometrist and they're trying to, you know, get you the right glasses so you can see properly, they're basically trying to get the, whatever you're looking at, the image here, so that it'll be focused right on the retina perfectly. Okay, so that I usually spend my time of the day fine-tuning that to make sure the image is right on the retina so you can see clearly. Okay, so that's hyperopia. Okay, presbyopia. If you look at the, this word here, the, the interpretation of this word means, right there, old eyes. <laughs> so usually when people kind of get into their 40s, and I've been there for over 10 years, you start having trouble focusing up close, right? You guys have, you know, anybody over 40 knows about this. And so this starts to happen to you. Why does it happen? You've lived your whole life, maybe some of you without any glasses, and all of a sudden you get into your mid-40s and it's like, oh man, I can't read this anymore. What's going on? What is going on? What is going on is that the lens, remember I told you the lens is right behind the iris. This is for the quiz later. The lens is right behind the iris. And did you know that the lens inside the eye continues to grow through your lifetime? It continues to grow. Just like your ears and your nose continue to grow, so does the lens inside the eye. Okay, and so as it's growing, it's getting bigger inside the eye, there becomes a little bit less room for it. Now, what I haven't told you is that whenever you, let's say you don't wear any glasses, okay, you're a young person, you don't wear glasses, and you go to look at something up close, clear as a bell. The reason why it's instantly clear and that just shows you how God made us. It's instantly clear when you look at that if your eyes are working properly as a young person. The reason it goes instantly clear when you go from distance and look at something up close, it's because this lens, it's changing its shape fast. Like super fast. It changes its shape so that the, the light will focus on the retina at that image, at that object that you're looking at up close. It does it instantly. And, you know, mine, mine still kind of focuses, but there's a bit of a lag now because I'm getting a little bit older. And so what happens is, is that you lose the ability to change the shape of that lens. And that's presbyopia. Because you lose, because it's the changing of the shape of the lens that allows you to focus at something up close. And so you're losing that as you start to get older. The lens starts to get harder. Anybody have any stiffness in their body as you get a little bit older? I know I've got it already. And so what happens is this lens starts to get stiffer. It gets harder. And not only that, it's getting bigger. And so it's harder for it to change the shape of that lens. And the lens has to change its shape instantly in order for you to see clearly. That's something up close. Okay, so this is presbyopia. And the older you get, you lose more and more of that ability to focus up close. And you need stronger and stronger reading glasses. That usually levels off around 60 or 65. Because it can't get any worse. <laughs> Sadly to say. So basically, uh, this is because the lens is getting harder and there's less room. Now, if you were to look in the human eye... And you were just to look at the eye in the microscope. And I've seen this sometimes in people who don't have irises. For whatever reason, they had an injury, it was removed, or they were born that way. If you look closely in the microscope, it looks like this lens is magically suspended. It's like magic. I look in there, I'm like, what's holding this lens in place? It's just miraculously floating right in the center of your eye. How is that possible? I mean, it's a total miracle. Basically, if you look closely, you can see these things called zonular fibers. And if you were to look at it in the microscope, you'd say they're spider webs. That's what they look like. So basically, you've got here... You know what? I'm just going to back up to the anatomy. Okay, let's take a look at this now. Here's the lens. And there's this muscle right here. It's called the ciliary body. And part of it is also the iris. They're connected. They're similar tissue, okay? And so here, you've got these spider web-like fibers. They're called zonular fibers that suspend the lens. It looks like it's just in midair. It's just floating there. But they hold that lens in place. And they change the shape of the lens. It's them pulling on the lens that changes the shape of the lens that allows you to focus up close. Utterly amazing. I don't know how you could look at the eye and not see that there's a designer there. Because everything screams design. There's no way that this system could happen by chance. If I, if I could spend days up here explaining to you the anatomy of the eye, I'd have to get all my old anatomy books out. But it's utterly amazing all of the components that make an eye work. Okay, so let's go back to presbyopia, old eyes. Okay, that's on the quiz later. Now, 
Um, so what happens is when you get older in your 40s and your 50s, you start needing reading glasses, you need it to see stuff up close, right? Because here, your eye cannot change the shape that it needs to change in order to read something up close. So then you put on these plus glasses. It's hard to see that lens, but there's a lens there. <coughs> like a plus 2 or a plus 250. Okay, astigmatism. Boy, is there ever a stigma attached to this word. <laughs> Everybody it always gets this term confused. And that's okay. So astigmatism is really interesting. If you have a high amount of astigmatism and you're not wearing your glasses and you cover one eye, you might see double. Usually people see doubles because they get bonked on the head or they have something wrong and the two eyes are not aligned. But with astigmatism, you can see double with one eye if it's high. Why is that? That is because the cornea is kind of misshapen. The outer part of the eye, remember the part that the contact lens sits on? The cornea is more curved in one meridian than it is in the other meridian. So the eye might be more curved this way, but it's flatter this way. And so as a result, when the light focuses on the back of the eye, you're getting two different images in different spots. When you get a, two different images, you can see double. So basically, it, it kind of makes like a, if people have a lower amount of astigmatism, it might be kind of a ghost thing they see. But if you have a higher amount of astigmatism, you'll actually see two images. Okay, and so, so you see here how we've got like a normal eye, you've got the light coming to one point of focus on the retina. Here, the light has got two points of focus. That's what astigmatism really is. And so that's what makes it kind of blurry. And anyways, we've got glasses for that. And uh, they put the, in the glasses, they have the glasses for astigmatism correction. They're called toric. And there's even contact lenses that are, that will correct astigmatism as well. So you can see clearly. But the higher the amount of astigmatism, the more, the more difficult it is to get glasses that uh, will clear, the contacts that will clear it up. Now, here's a picture of the brain. And the reason I'm showing you this, and I remember distinctly, you know, when I was in second year we had of optometry, we had to learn all of these nerves, and you had to learn if they were sending a signal, if they were receiving a signal, or both. <laughs> afferent, efferent. And anyways, here we've got the 12 cranial nerves. Anybody in the, in the health industry knows about these. And basically, you've, you've got these 12 nerves that come out of the brain, okay? And here they're, they're listed, okay? Number one is olfactory, that's for the nose. Number two is the optic. Three is ocular motor. Four is the trochlear. Five is the trigeminal. Six is the abducens. Seven is facial. And then eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve are vestibular, cochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, uh, spinal accessory, and gloss, hypoglossal, excuse me. So, out of these twelve cranial nerves, six of them are used by the eye. Okay? That's how important the eye is and how much information has to either go to the eye or come to the eye in order for your eyes to work properly. Okay? So your brain has six of the cranial nerves that are being used. Some in, for other things as well, but... So number two is the optic nerve. That's the one that sends the information to your brain from what you see. Okay? Now does anybody know how many ocular motor... How many, excuse me, how many muscles you have to move the eye. Does anybody know? Nope. It is six. So you've got, you've got uh, one that moves it up and down. You've got one that moves it purely up and down if it's rotated to the side. You've got another one that moves it down. You've got one that moves it out, one in, one down. So you've got six um, of these. And so they are in the ocular motor. There is one nerve called the trochlear. It has the furthest path to go. And so it's usually the one that gets damaged. If somebody gets bonked on their head, it could damage that nerve more easily and then their eyes will not work properly. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you these. I'm not going to go through all of them. We'll be here all day if I have to explain to you what each of these um, cranial nerves do. But some of them are for the eye movement. Some of them, one of them is for pupil control. One of them is specifically just to move the eye... Uh, to abduct the eye, that's to pull it out. If it doesn't work, then the eye turns in, for example, if somebody has a problem with that one. And I've seen that when people have like cancer or some, some tumor at the back of their, uh, in their brain area. It can, if you have a tumor growing, it'll push on the nerve. The nerve doesn't work properly, then the eye will turn in. So then we have to kind of figure out what's causing the eye to turn in. 
for example. And when it usually gets to that point, I'm sending them to a specialist. I'm an optometrist, not an ophthalmologist. Usually the ophthalmologist is the one who's going to treat them and, you know, order MRIs and try and figure out what's going on. But sometimes they end up in my chair first, and then I have to ship them out to who they need to see to try and fix the problem. Okay, so this one is really interesting. And um, so I just wanted to show you, this is the pathway of light. So things that happen on the right side of your field, and this is for both eyes, okay? So from the midline, straight ahead, on both eyes, what you see on the right side over here, so if I'm twingling my fingers over here, the image is being cast on, the information that's over here eventually is going to end up on this part of my brain, on the left side, okay? In the visual cortex, it's area number 19 is where it ends up. Anywhere from 17 down to 19, that's where the information goes in. And it goes on this side of the brain. What is going on over here in this world, as I look straight ahead, whatever is I'm wiggling over here, that information is getting processed over here on the right side of my brain. Now sometimes, um, maybe you know somebody, I think somebody mentioned to me too, that uh, if you have like a stroke sometimes, or a, I, I had a family member who had a, had a stroke, and what it did was it... it, 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 it damaged this part of the brain. One, I can't remember which side it was. It damaged one part of the, the one side of the brain. And as a result, they couldn't see what was on the right side. And when that happens to you, you lose your driver's license. Because if you can't see on the right side, if you have to make a turn and sit, you won't see the car beside you, you'll hit them, right? So if that happens to you, it can be devastating to your life uh, if you can't drive anymore, for example. I'm going to talk about eye diseases here in a little bit, but I just wanted to give you an idea, you know, how complex this system is. I'm not going to get into the intricacies of it, but basically what you see on the right side, it gets cast on this side of the retina, on the left side, whatever's in the right field, and then that information just follows the blue. So what you see here in the blue, it comes over here, hits this side of the retina, and then it follows that path, it crosses over just right around at the pituitary gland, and that's why sometimes when people come to me if they have a pituitary tumor, and I do a visual field, check their peripheral vision, I can find the tumor because they won't be seeing properly. They'll have a particular defect in their visual field that will tell me they've got something wrong with the chiasm here. So anyways, this information comes over here and it ends up on this part of the retina at the back. Okay, so that's why if you have a head injury at the back, it could affect your vision, sad to say. Okay, and the same thing with the other side. The left side comes to this side of the retina and then that information on both eyes and then it comes over to this side. So if somebody has a stroke over here, they won't be able to see in their left visual field. And that's how we can tell. So that's kind of the investigative work that we have to do sometimes. It doesn't happen. I don't see that many people like that, but uh, it happens sometimes, sadly. Okay. So I just kind of gave you a little bit of an overview of the anatomy of the eye and how the, how the information you know, gets into the brain and um, you know, how the brain... The, you know, it's not, just, it's not just the optic nerve that is responsible for your sight, okay? Because some of the nerves are responsible also for the um, sensitivity in the cornea that you feel the eye. And maybe you've heard of somebody who's had Bell's palsy. Maybe even somebody here has had Bell's palsy. And that's when one of these nerves gets damaged, usually due to a virus, and then that person can't close their eye. They can't close it properly, and as a result, the eye can dry out. And it can cause scarring on the eye and they can get visually impaired from it. So it can be pretty serious. And that's not the optic nerve. That's one of the other cranial nerves, okay? And that's the facial nerve, number seven. Okay, so um, I, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the diseases of the eye and some things that we need to do that we can learn about to help us to make sure that we don't get into this, uh, you know, these, some of these categories. And maybe some of you have already had some of these things happen to you. Before I get into these, do we have any questions about the anatomy of the eye? I know that we have a roaming mic. I think uh, Mrs. Putt might, or we can give her one of these mics. Are there any questions about the anatomy of the eye, what we've talked about thus far? Like, you know, nearsighted, farsighted. Okay, let's go back to the anatomy. We got the anatomy of the eye. Oh, I want to say one thing about the anatomy while I got it right here. I just remembered. Okay, so this in, in the eye here is called the vitreous, okay? And it's like a gel. It really is like a gel. And it's kind of like it sticks together. When, you, if, when I see it in the microscope, and people, it'll swing around in the eye, but it all kind of sticks together. <coughs> now, it's very common after the age of about 55. I'm still waiting for mine to happen. This vitreous body will shrink. Maybe it comes because of dehydration over the years, but it tends to shrink. And when it pulls away from the retina, 
It can, it's, it's called a posterior vitreous detachment. Now many of you over the age of 55 have probably had it happen to you where you started to see floaters that you never had before. And maybe a little bit of flashing. And uh, that's often when the vitreous pulls away from the, the back of the eye. It's called a vitreous detachment. But if you're seeing flashes of light, it could be there's actually a tear in the retina. And I know somebody today mentioned to me they had a tear in the retina. And they'll usually laser it up. But sometimes when the gel pulls away from the retina, it can cause a tear, which has to be fixed fairly quickly because a tear can lead to a retinal detachment and a retinal detachment can lead to vision impairment permanently. So you don't want to have that happen to you. So if you ever were to see flashes of light, like lightning, and you know, a curtain, or you're starting to see all these floaters you've never seen before, you should get your eyes checked right away. Okay, that is very important. I've had people come in and say, oh, I started to see this floater in a flash. Sure enough, I take a look at there. Oh, you got a retinal tear. And then I have to ship them down to the eye surgeon right away so they can laser it up or do more invasive procedures to fix that problem to save their vision because you can lose your sight from that. But having the gel pull away from the retina is very common. And most of the time, it doesn't lead to problems. Only rarely will it actually lead to a tear in the retina. And people with higher amounts of nearsightedness, high amounts of myopia, are at higher risk of retinal tears, by the way. So do we have any questions on the material that I covered thus far? Yes, ma'am. Oh, we have a mic coming. Let's, let's bring the mic there, because if people are watching online, they, they wanna, we want them to hear it as well. What would cause vertigo? What would cause? Vertigo. Vertigo. You know, most of the time, vertigo is not so eye-related. It's usually coming from the inner ear organ, okay, that's responsible for your balance. Okay, in fact, if you're dizzy, when you have your eyes open and your head is straight ahead, that helps to keep you from having vertical problems because your eyes will tell your brain the world isn't moving. But if something else is wrong with your balance organ, which is like right inside the ear area, that can lead to vertigo. So that's more where that problem is coming from, not your eyes. However, um, if this organ in the ear is not firing properly, if the nerves are not firing properly, it can make you dizzy, it can give you vertigo. And in fact, it's even a board question, that if you put warm water in the ear, you have to know which way the eyes are going to do an astagmus thing based on the warm water in the air, because it will trick your brain to think that the world is moving, but it's not. So when you have your eyes open, that actually helps to prevent you from having vertical problems because the eyes are telling the brain, no, the world is not swinging around. But usually vertigo is coming from the inner ear organ. It's not related to the eyes. Any other questions about what we talked about? Nearsighted, farsighted, presbyopia, astigmatism, any of those? Or the anatomy of the eye? People always have questions about the eye. Oh, what does it mean? What does this mean? Not so much anatomy, you were talking about vertigo and uh, the nerve connection. I don't know, was that Laurie asked that question? No, no? okay, uh, Mary. Uh, because um, they use gamapentin uh, to treat uh, certain types of uh, vertigo. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Is that because of the nerve conductivity? Uh, I, I think it has, again, has to do with the, uh, the vestibular. Okay. Yeah, with the inner ear. It's, it's outside my range. It's not related to the eye. Right, okay. So, yeah. No, I can't, I, can't, uh, I can't speak. I, I don't want to say anything that's not right. So, <laughs> concerning that, yeah. I can show you that the cranial nerve that is responsible for that is number eight. Vestibular cochlear. You see the cochlear? So that nerve, number eight, is for your hearing and it splits into two it's for the cochlear part. It's the cochlear part that is controlling, you know, your balance organ that, that's in the ear there. So that's outside my, uh, my jurisdiction here. <laughs> oh, the question's way at the back, okay. Okay, so my question is, you mentioned a change in diet can possibly affect eyesight? A change and in the diet might possibly affect eyesight. So I was wondering um, if your is there a possibility of your eyesight being improved by change in diet? I heard a doctor say that one time so I was kind of Yeah, curious. so I mean you know the eye is kind of complex as, as we've already seen and here's the story you know think about it you guys have cameras, right? In a camera, 
Are you changing the shape of that camera every day? <laughs> no, you're not taking the camera and making it longer or shorter. Remember, your eye is a living tissue and it's soft, relatively speaking, right? It's quite soft. And so it's also organic, right? You're, you have millions and trillions of organic reactions that are going on every day. And so it's amazing that our eyes are as stable as they are. It, it utterly amazes me how stable they can be. So if in other words, there's a number of things that can change your prescription, okay? So in other words, if you change the length of the eye, that'll change your prescription. It'll affect how you see. If you change the lens of the eye, that'll affect how you see. If you change the curvature of the cornea, that'll affect your prescription as well. So it's a number of things, factors, that could affect your prescription. So your vision could get worse, it could get better. In my over 25 years experience of seeing patients, I know, and I've read about it, there's a, there's a natural drift for us to become less nearsighted or more farsighted in time. So that, that tends to happen to the population. Um, and that could be due to shrinkage of the eye. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer this question. Like I said, it's a complicated answer. You know, can my diet change my prescription? Because there's so many factors, it's hard to say that one thing is going to, like your diet, is going to change your prescription. It, it's a really tricky thing to, to, to try and answer. But I'll say this. For example, when you get cataracts, here's the lens of the eye. We're, we're just going to talk about cataracts now. When you get a cataract, the lens inside the eye gets cloudy. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. But what happens is when it gets cloudy, its refractive index increases. Does anybody know what our index of refraction is? Does anybody know? One of the things that has the highest index of refraction on the planet is a diamond. So in other words, when light goes into a diamond, it makes a big turn. Okay? When you, you know when you send light into the lake, if you look at something that's in the water, and you look at it out of the water and in the, in the water, it look kind of like tilted, like out of the water it's like this, but in the water it's like tilted, it's changed. The light will bend even more when it goes into a diamond. So when light enters the eye through the lens, it, it has refractive power. Its refractive index is around 1.33, I think. And so what happens is, when you get a cataract, the refractive index of that lens usually will increase. Like, more like a diamond. And it bends the light more. So in other words, if you bend the light more, the light's going to focus in front of the retina, and it'll make you more nearsighted as a result. Okay? So it's all a matter of optics. Remember, you know, when I look at the eye, I see God's handiwork. But the rules that God has set up for science, He set them up. He's the originator of the rules, right? He's the originator of the Ten Commandments. He's also the, the originator of like the first, second, and third law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> and so light, when it hits an object with a higher refractive index, is going to bend the light more. So it's going to make you more nearsighted, okay? And so... Um, you know, like, th there's a certain rule that the light has to obey. <laughs> light obeys the rules of, of focusing. And so if you increase the refractive index, the light's going to focus in front of the retina. Okay? So, it's a, it's a, it, even though it's a living tissue, just like how when they make a camera, they make it so it focuses perfectly on there, so you get a clear image when you take your picture, right? <clears throat> Same thing at the back of your eye. That's why if you need glasses, the glasses focus the light so it focuses right on the retina where it's supposed to be to give you a clear image. Now, if you have a, uh, something go wrong with your eye, it could change that, and I've seen it all the time. People come in, they say their vision's fuzzy, I check their prescription, oh my goodness, you became so much more nearsighted. I'm talking about a big jump. And I'm trying, what happened? I look in, sure enough, they got a cataract. Okay? So when you have a, and I, I'm a real proponent of, of healthful living, the health message is the right arm of the gospel. And so there are aspects, for example, if you're a diabetic, sometimes I have diabetics come in and they didn't know they were diabetic, but their prescription changed huge. And they say, oh, my vision changed. I don't even need my glasses anymore. And I come in and say, oh, I was just diagnosed with diabetes. And they say, I need new glasses now because I can't see. I said, don't get new glasses. Because once you get your blood sugar under control, your prescription is going to change back to the way it was. Because what happened with the diabetes was, remember I said, if you change the refractive index of the cornea, the light will focus in a different spot. The fo light will focus somewhere else now, and their vision will be totally blurry. So I say, wait about six weeks, get your blood sugar under control, and then your vision will probably come back. Maybe not to the same point that it was, <coughs> but it'll probably come back.
But it's not only the lens. Remember I said the lens is only about 15 diopters. The whole eye power, do you guys remember what it was? This is preparatory for the quiz after, afterwards. 60, right? So the whole eye is 60. The lens is about 15. Every, it's a little bit different in everybody. And the cornea is around, usually between 42 and 45, okay? And so what happens is, is if you have diabetes and you get swelling in the cornea or swelling in the lens, it's going to change the refractive index of that tissue because it's a living tissue and it'll change your prescription. Okay, so to answer the question that yes, diet can have an impact, especially if you're having an extreme uh, of extremely high blood sugars or if you're developing cataracts. So I, I don't know if that answered the question entirely, but it's a complicated answer. It's not like a one thing. Um, but I will speak to the question about good lifestyle habits, including food, and the health of the eye. Okay, so we're going to move on to eye diseases, because that was the other half of this presentation, is to understand some eye diseases and what we might be able to do to help prevent them and just have an understanding of them. The first one I'm going to talk about is age-related macular degeneration. Has everybody heard of this disease? Yeah, it's, you know, especially, um, as you can see, it says age-related. So there's definitely an increased risk when you get older. Um, yeah. So here is a picture of the back of the eye. Okay, this is what it looks in. This is what I look in and I see every day when I go to work. I see pictures of the back. I look in the back of the eye. This is the optic nerve. I, mean, I showed you the optic nerve. What's really interesting about the eye, and I mean, you know, God is God. He makes it the way he makes it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have designed it this way, but you know what? He knows best. He knows that this is a better way. There is both the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein pass through the middle of the optic nerve. The optic nerve is like a cable that sends the information of what you see to your brain, right? That's what the nerve does. It sends the information to the brain. Running in the middle of that cable is the blood supply for the retina. Unbelievable. Okay? So the blood, you know, the, the blood comes into the eye through the artery. Here's an artery right there. And then it gives the oxygen and nutrients to the retina. And then it goes, to, it, it fills, then it, the blood comes out of the capillaries and it comes into the vein. Here is the vein, that's a bigger, the veins are usually wider. This is a retinal vein and then it joins and it becomes the central retinal vein and that vein goes to your heart and so on, okay? Now, here right in the middle is where the fovea or the macula is. Remember we talked about the macula, that's the part of the retina that allows you to read or see things of detail, right? When you get a buildup, and I can, the, 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 I can show you a video and, but, it just gets too complicated, but basically this area here, you get this buildup of a metabolic waste product called drusen. Can you say drusen? Drusen, okay, so you just increased your vocabulary today. Drusen is a metabolic waste product buildup. And when you get a lot of it in the macula, you've got macular degeneration. Now, back to that question about the health. So, God put in your eye something called lutein in the macula. In fact, the name of the macula is the macula lutea. Why? Because of the pigment lutein that's in the macula. It gives it a yellowish color. Maybe you've seen like lutein, they talk about it with like egg yolks. That's not the, place, the great place to get the lutein. Even the doctors that you go see here will tell you one of the sources of, the sources of lutein, which is healthy for the eye, is spinach, sorry, in order, kale, spinach, orange peppers. Okay, so those are natural sources of lutein. What does lutein do? It helps to protect the macula against oxidative damage. What is oxidative damage? Can anybody tell me? You've heard of free radicals and antioxidants? Antioxidants are usually like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E. Okay, so they help to fight free radicals, right? You don't want free radicals? You don't want radicals, right? So radicals are damaging to the tissue and you know, free radical damages. For example, if you're lying in the sun too much, it'll cause, you know, free radicals. But if you eat the wrong foods, that is also a source of free radicals. Okay? Um, yeah, and so, you know, we have a health message. And so if we're following the health message, you have less likelihood of having free radicals. Anyways, you get free radical damage in the macula because the macula is very hard working. It works really hard. It's working, it met, met, metabolizes very hard. Whenever you're metabolizing very hard, you have waste. And if the waste is not removed, it builds up. And if it builds up too much, you get this deposit of drusen in the macula. And once you have drusen in the macula, eventually it can lead to the breakdown of the tissue. Okay, and then that's macular degeneration. Now, this is kind of 
moderate macular, dry macular degeneration. And, you know, it might be another 10 years before it really, really affects their vision. You can have macular degeneration for years and it not really impact your vision. There's two kinds of macular degeneration. One is wet, one is dry. Wet is when you get new blood vessel growth underneath the macula, which then devastates the macula. And that can happen within a few months. You can lose your vision. So that's why if you ever notice, you know, your vision really get blurry from what... Okay, I can just talk a little bit louder for now until he comes. So, number one leading cause of blindness in, uh, in North America. He's going to come here. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. How do you your It's on the time when it goes off. Oh, okay. So it's back? It should be coming back? Okay, great. So, um, remember, number one cause of blindness in, in, in America, macular degeneration. So, when I see somebody who comes in and they have this disease, I tell them, make sure you're eating spinach, kale, and eat it raw. You know, when you cook it, you lose a lot of nutrition, you got to eat it raw. Spinach, kale, orange peppers, they have the highest concentration of lutein. Make sure you're getting them in your diet. But there's something I really want to address. You know, we have a health message that says that we should eliminate animal products from our diet. You've heard that before, right? And, you know, if, if, if you're consuming animal products, the animals leave a little bit of themselves behind in your vessels. And when that happens, you obstruct the flow in a vessel. Okay, and if you obstruct the flow in a vessel, you're obstructing the oxygen and the nutrition that's in the, in the blood from getting to the tissue. Remember the Bible says, where is the life? It's in the blood. So the blood is bringing life to the tissues. If you have a process that is narrowing the arteries and you're obstructing the flow of nutrients to a tissue, what's going to happen to that tissue? It's going to die, right? Diabetics, when you're a diabetic and you're not getting proper nutrition to your toes or some extremity in your body, what happens to it? It gets gangrene and they have to cut it off, right? So if you're having a lack of nutrition and oxygen to a tissue, it starts to die. It's the same everywhere in the body. It doesn't matter what it is. So if you're not getting proper circulation to the macular or to the retinal area, things don't work properly then. You're not removing the waste products then. And if you're not removing the waste products, then the tissue will start to die. So you start to get a buildup of this waste product that's called drusen. And so it damages the tissue and it can lead to blindness. So, I also tell people, <clears throat> make sure you're exercising. If you're diabetic, that's like half your battle right there. Because when you have diabetes, half of the enzymes that take the sugar from your blood and bring them into the cells where they need to be are activated when you exercise. That's half the battle right there when you're a diabetic. Well, it's the same thing if you've got macular degeneration. You want to exercise to get proper circulation to that tissue to remove those waste products. It makes sense. It's all logical, right? You know, in the Bible it says, in the beginning was the... Does anybody know what the word is after that? The word, but if you look at the original, the word is logos, which means logic, okay? We live in a world of cause and effect. If you obstruct the blood flow to the tissue, the tissue will die, right? That's why God gave us the health message, because he doesn't want to see us sick and having blindness issues. Okay, so we're back to the anatomy. So here we have just a picture of dry macular degeneration. This is wet. You can see the blood here in the eye. This is a bit ominous, but it's possible it could clear. Now, just so you know, you know, if you have dry macular degeneration, the only treatment they really have at this time is to say, eat your veggies, eat your greens with the lutein. Now, wet macular degeneration, there is a treatment for this. Needle in the eye. Maybe, maybe you know somebody who's had it. That's a very common, that's a treatment, is they inject uh, an anti-VEGF drug into the eye to try and stop uh, this process. It is kind of successful, but if you've lost vision, even if it stops the process, your vision's still lost, right? So you don't want this, for sure. Hopefully you won't get it in the other eye if you get wet macular degeneration. You have a question. Um, somebody's going to bring the mic to you. Denise, it was just over here. The next one we're going to talk about is glaucoma, but we, we're going to answer this question first. 
There is a very interesting verse here. Okay, Ecclesiastes. Sure. I, I agree. Like, we, we, can't, we, can't the, we cannot separate the creator from the creation, can we? Right. You cannot right. separate the two. Mm -hmm. And in 11, Ecclesiastes 11:7, truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. And especially in the morning, it is cold. How my earth has improved, you know, that I, I haven't, I haven't, I don't have to change my lens. Okay. It's amazing. It can the happen. Benefit of that. It can happen. Yeah. That's right. Thank yeah. God for it. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank God. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to move on to glaucoma. You ever heard of glaucoma? Most people heard of glaucoma, right. Okay. This is also a common one. I see a lot of this in, in where I am. Um, basically, you know, I'm kind of summarizing here. If there's a group of op optometrists here, they, they would, you know, want to correct me. But basically, glaucoma is increased pressure inside the eye. And then that leads to damage of the optic nerve. Technically, it's an optic neuropathy because I see patients who have normal pressures but still develop glaucoma. Yeah. Okay, so glaucoma is basically the optic nerve is dying slowly. But it's your sight. <laughs> you don't want it to happen, right? It, that's how you see, is your optic nerve. Usually, people have high pressures inside the eye that leads to damage of the optic nerve. That's glaucoma. Now, like I said, sometimes people have normal pressures and they still develop glaucoma. So it can't just be all about pressure. And so, Ultimately, there's still not a proper circulation to the optic nerve. There's something that's killing the nerve. So if somebody has glaucoma, usually we prescribe drops to lower the pressure. Now sometimes a laser could be done to open up the trabecular meshwork to increase the outflow of fluid in the eye. But usually when somebody has glaucoma, they'll have like drops to lower the pressure. And I can usually tell when people are on those drops because their eyes look different when they're on some of those drops. I can usually tell by looking at them. Um, because the drops have side effects. Remember, all drugs have side effects. Now, if you have glaucoma and your pressures are really high, you kind of need the drops to lower the pressure to try and save your vision. But, I would say you want to do everything you can to help preserve that by doing the exercise, going back to the diet and exercise. If you're eating the right foods, you have a better chance of blood, proper blood circulation to that tissue, decrease the chance of the disease from progressing, right? Makes sense. Back to the logos. And so, um, Anyways, high eye pressure, usually they treat with uh, laser, sometimes, uh, or with uh, drops, sometimes they use laser. And if they still can't control the pressure, then they're doing other surgery. They cut up the eye and they put valves in the eye and, you know, it gets kind of not nice. Um, so again, if you've got any disease, including a disease of the eye, I would say you need to exercise because you want to get good blood circulation. You want to have a diet that doesn't consume animal products because animal products clog up your blood vessels and they obstruct the flow to the tissue. The tissue has a disease, right? So, you know, we have this health message and it's logos. It makes sense that God is telling us not to consume these things. Now as Adventists, we can look back. The health, does anybody know that the year that, that the health message was kind of given to the church? Does anybody know what year it was? 1863 was when a bulk of like the health message was given. And like it took them 100 years later, it was in 1964 that the AMA um, said that, you know what, smoking, we think smoking might cause lung cancer. Okay, it took them until 1964 to figure that out. We were given the message in 1863, don't smoke. Don't, you know, reduce your animal product consumption. So we were given that message. And now science has caught up to the message that God gave the church. And now we, everybody knows that. When I was growing up, lots of people were smoking. I was at, the, I was at NASA uh, yesterday and we were watching these videos from like the, the 70s and the 80s when they were sending up the space shuttle. And everybody is like smoking on these videos. And like today, almost nobody, a lot, lot fewer people are smoking because we, the message got out there, don't, don't smoke, don't, don't, don't touch the tobacco. And so it's funny how science is finally catching up with the message that God gave the church. All right, next one. So this is what an optic nerve looks like when it's normal, when you look at it in close-up. And this is the nerve tissue right here, okay? So this is the tissue that sends the information to the brain, which is from about here to here. This is the outer part of the optic nerve. Out here is the retina. This, the optic nerve tissue, this rim tissue right here is thinner. And so it's, it, you're getting a bright reflection back from the light that you're shining in. This is the nerve, what's left. 
Okay, because they've lost nerve tissue here. And so this, is, this person has, you know, moderate glaucoma, moderate to advanced glaucoma. They can still see, but they're, they're starting to lose their peripheral vision. That's what glaucoma does. It damages usually the peripheral vision more. And eventually the central. Hopefully you never get to that state. Okay, does anybody know what this is? What does it look? This is a cataract, that's right. So here this person is dilated. The pupil is opened up. So you can just see the edge of the iris. And this is the lens that I was telling you about that's right behind the iris. And this lens has become like whitish. And this is an advanced cataract. Okay, they should have had surgery a long time ago to take it out. Okay, so a cataract is when the lens, which is right here, this is normal. So when you look in somebody's eyes that doesn't have cataract, it's like a black pupil. If they have an advanced cataract, <clears throat> then you'll see that it's kind of whitish there. Okay, here is, I think this is my second last disease that I want to talk about, dry eye. And it's often missed by doctors. They might kind of see it, but we're really understanding now that dry eye is a very common problem. And one of the things that's also leading to dry eye in young people is all the media devices. Get them off their media devices, or at least give them a break. Um, you know, at least for every hour they're on a media device, you should have 10 minutes off of it, okay? When you are looking at media devices, including the TV, we don't blink very much. So when you stop blinking, the surface of the eye starts to dry up. Okay, now it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the fact remains, your eyeballs don't produce the fluid that lubricates your eye. Where does it come from? It comes from your lids and the glands around the eye. You've got a lacrimal gland up here, you've got goblet glands, you've got meibomian glands, you've got all these different glands that produce the lubricants for your eye. Because if there's not lubricated, it'll dry out. And if it's drying out, you ain't seeing. Okay, so here we have a dry eye. When the, dry, when the eyes get kind of dry, they usually get more red. So sometimes people want to put like visine in their eyes to make their eyes less red. Oh, my eyes are red. It's probably because their eyes are dry and they need to lubricate their eyes, not put visine in. Remember, drugs only last for so long. After 20 minutes, it'll turn red again. That's why visine is no good. Here are some of the dry eye symptoms. And maybe you've had burning before. Your eyes are feeling kind of burning, like especially in the evening. Or maybe they're starting to feel scratchy or irritated. Or maybe even they feel dry. Sometimes the eyelids are starting to look a little bit red. And your eyelids are feeling kind of heavy, especially in the evenings. And it's not just because you're tired. Gritty. Sometimes people come in and say, oh, I got sand in my eyes. I feel like I got you know, sand going on in my eyes. Now we're in Florida, so your, your air is pretty humid here. But this is really a problem, especially going on the uh, West Coast. I have a friend who's an optometrist in Vegas. He said they got real dry eye problems there. When your cornea is irritated from dryness, it can cause light sensitivity, eye fatigue, sometimes itching or stinging, and watery eyes. When you're thinking, wait a minute, how can I have dry eyes but my eyes are watery? Here is how it works. And this is a bit of an enigma in that, okay, when you've got dry eyes, how can they be watering? When your eyes get dry, what's happening is when they get irritated, it's because the cornea, remember what the contact lens sits on is the cornea, that part gets irritated. When it's irritated, it feels like it's kind of burning. It sends a signal to your brain saying, oh, alarm, we've got a dry eye issue here, and the eye will kind of water. But it's not really a good protective tear. It's just like an emergency tear to kind of keep you, you know, so you don't have like serious problems. But it's a sign that you have dry eye, and you still need to treat it. Otherwise, you can run into problems. Dry eye is, uh, dramatically affects women more than men, by the way. Okay, and they have, they have numbers of upwards of, any, I've heard numbers anywhere between 16 million and 50 million Americans suffer from dry eye. And I'm sure there are some people here who suffer from dry eye. I get it too sometimes. Just to give you an idea of the complexity of the tear film. You know, this was interesting when I was studying this uh, years ago. And, um, you know, they say that, you know, the chimpanzee is our closest relative and all these kind of things. And what's really interesting is that in, in our tear film, we have something called lysozyme, okay, which is an enzyme uh, that helps to protect our eye against bugs and other problems, uh, you know, other microorganisms. Lysozyme uh, and, uh, is found in the tear film of chickens. <laughs> all right, so it's just interesting. Like God has put these things all over the place. And it, but the monkeys don't have it, which is kind of interesting. Anyways, so here we have the cornea. And over top of the cornea, which is the pink tissue here, we've got this mucin layer. Then we've got an aqueous or watery layer. And then we've got a lipid or fat layer. Okay? And so you've got three components to the tears. One is to attach the, the, the tears to the cornea because the cornea is um, hydro... 
um, phobic. It doesn't like having water on it. Like the water will run off, but you need to have water on it. So it's got this um, mucin layer that helps attach the tears to your cornea. Okay? And helps protect against bad bugs. When I say bad bugs, I'm talking about bacteria from damaging your cornea. Okay? And so you need to have a proper tear film. If you don't have a proper tear film, it leaves you more susceptible to infection on the cornea. Okay? Or the rest of the eye for that matter. So you don't, so you want to have a good tear film. And when you have dry eyes, you've got problems with this tear film. Okay? So the mucin is, is made by one set of cells. The aqueous is made by another uh, gland. And the lipid layer is made by the mebobian glands. And you say, the what? <laughs> You've got these glands up here in the lid, both upper and lower, that secrete the oil for your tear film or the lipid layer. And the oil prevents evaporation of the tears. So when people have dry eyes, we have to make sure all of these layers are in good shape. And that's why I've got this here today. And I'm, I'm just going to talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, I guess I can talk about that now. So this, these are little pads. They're eye pads, but not the eye pads like this, okay? These, is, these are called eye hydrating compresses. This is, this is sold by an American company here. I get them from the States usually. Um, and they're... <clears throat> so what happens is when you have dry eyes, like I said, the dryness is coming from the tissue around the eye. It's not the eyeball itself that's the problem. It's the tissue around it. And so when people have, you know, real dry eye problems, we tell them to use artificial tears. You want to use non-preserved ones. And there are some good quality ones. You can ask me about it afterwards. I'm not trying to tout or sell any company here. But they're, using artificial tears can really be helpful if you have dry eyes. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's not a drug. It's just a lubricant. Secondly, when people have real dry eye problems, I tell them to use these. And again, I'm not trying to tout a product. You don't have to use this. I can give you an alternative to this, but I tell people to get something like this. This is a pad. You heat it up. Uh, you can heat it up in the microwave. I don't have a microwave, but you can heat it up in the microwave. And you put it over top of your eyes for about 5 to 10 minutes. This will get it up to the right temperature, which is about 42 Celsius. And when you get the temperature up to 42 Celsius, the oil glands then can secrete the, comp the components of the tear film. And they're needed to make your tear film stable. And when I give this to people and they do it, they say it helps them out dramatically when they have dry eye problems. More than putting in the good artificial tears. Um, so I just wanted to tell you about that. You don't have to get this product. You can like nuke a potato and wrap it in a cloth and just hold it over top of your eye. I used to tell people to use like hot washcloth, but the washcloth gets cool quickly. It doesn't last long enough. The hydration is nice, but this will hold on to the heat for the 5 to 10 minutes. And so will a potato. Um, you can, like I said, nuke a potato and hold it over top of your eyes. The heat, don't burn yourself. Make sure those oil glands secrete their contents. It also increases circulation to those glands. And remember, you've got to have good circulation to a tissue if the tissue is going to work properly. So doing warm compresses really can help out dry eye problems, okay? So I really want to stress that. Um, warm compresses can really help dry eye problems. And for people who have severe dry eye problems, this is one of the mainstays of their treatment, believe me. So that's what I have as your gifts. If you can answer the questions, I've got a few here to give out. And um, if you need the name of, you can get these probably at the drugstore. Um, What's the up to about 42 Celsius. You know, 98.6 is 37 Celsius. Like 40 is what, 100 or so? So you need it a little over 100, you know, 100, maybe up to 105 or so. We have a question. Well, yeah, I mean, like, you could just simply, you, the reason why I tell people to get this is that, you know, it's, it's nice and easy, but some people don't want to spend, like, you know, 20, 30 bucks or whatever. Well, I, I mean, you just nuke it. What's that? Nuke? Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Microwave it or heat it up or bake it. Oh, bake. You could bake a potato so it's hot, but don't burn yourself and wrap it with a cloth. You can't put that straight on your eye. You'll burn the skin. Incidentally, the thinnest skin in the body, is on your eyelid. <laughs> okay, so you want to wrap it like in a cloth. But you want to get heat to those glands to get them to secrete the oil and also to stimulate, like you're, you're increasing the blood circulation to those glands. So that's a real important thing if you have dry eye. And I know that, um, you know, in, in a certain segment of the population, dry eyes are really a problem, okay? As people get older, that, that can be a real issue. Okay, the last disease I want to talk about, diabetic retinopathy. So if you remember, this is the number two leading cause of blindness, or the number one leading cause of blindness under the age of 65. 
And usually it's people who've had diabetes for a long time. This is a picture of the back of the eye in normal retina. Remember, here's the optic nerve. There's the blood vessels that supply half of the retina. The other half comes from, from underneath. And uh, here we've got the macula. Here we've got, you can see. So remember, diabetes affects the blood flow to a tissue. Diabetes damages blood vessels. When you don't get proper circulation, either to or away from the tissue, you get swelling in the tissue, okay? And so here we have protein that is leaking out of the blood vessels into the retina. So this retina is swollen, okay? Microscopically, but it's swollen. I'll show you a picture in a second of that. It's leaking. The blood is literally pouring, like coming out of the blood vessels because it, the tissue is full. It can't, you're not getting proper circulation. So you get this hemorrhaging in the back of the eye. Um, and you get this leaking of blood. So this is a problem eye. Like if I send this to the specialist, they're going to be doing the injections for sure when they see this, okay? It's the same treatment they do for macular degeneration. The injection in the eye. Here's a picture of an OCT. This is a picture of a normal rackiness. So we've taken the retina, we've turned it sideways, and we're looking at the tissue. And I look at these every day in my practice. This is a normal macula. Here we've got a little bit of swelling. The black is fluid in the retina. Whew. This is significant cystoid macular edema. There's significant swelling. This is all fluid in here because the fluid ain't draining properly. And this is like a, you know, this is a, this is a quite a problem here when you see this. Like their vision is compromised. Um, yeah, their vision's quite compromised in this situation. So, this is from diabetes. Now, you can get it from other problems too, um, but that's why diabetes is, is really a problem uh, concerning the eyes. Diabetes is a problem for any tissue if you don't get proper circulation. The reason why it's a problem for the eyes, because God has put very fine blood vessels in the retina, okay? So, in other words, if you look at this OCT, this is a, an image of the retina. This right here... Well, yeah, this is probably a blood vessel. Okay, so within, think of the camera. Within the film of the camera, you've got blood flowing through the tissue. Okay? Because the blood has to bathe those tissues. But those tissues have to be very uniform in order for you to see clear images. And so what happens is you've got these very small blood vessels supplying this tissue with oxygen and nutrients. Okay? It all goes back to that Bible verse. The life is in the blood. You've got to have blood flowing to this tissue in order for it to work properly. But then when you have a problem with your blood circulation, diabetes, high blood pressure, other things like that, elevated cholesterol, then you don't get proper circulation, and then boom, you get swelling in the tissue. And that's why sometimes diabetes is picked up in the eyes first because of the very small blood vessels. Diabetes damages those small blood vessels. That's why it's, it's important to get your eyes checked on a regular basis. Um, and one more point I wanted to make about glaucoma. I just want to say it, just to give you, again, a little bit of a heads up. Back to glaucoma, just for a sec. <clears throat> Sometimes people come to me and they're this advanced in their glaucoma. Because the pressure can rise inside the eye and you won't feel it. Until it gets super high. And by the time you notice that your vision's not right, you've usually lost half of your optic nerve due to glaucoma. Okay? African Americans are a little bit higher risk for glaucoma. So if you're in that segment of the population, make sure you get your eyes checked, especially once you get into your 50s and beyond. Okay? Um, glaucoma can happen to any segment in the population. I'm just saying, if you're African American, you have a little bit higher risk for glaucoma. So keep that in mind. Okay? So it's important to get your eyes checked on a regular basis. Um, because they can pick up these things before you get to this stage. Okay? So it is important. Just like going to see your doctor is also important too. Okay. So... Um, that concludes most of the information that I wanted to share with you. We have a few questions. We've got one here. And then we're going to have the quiz so I can give out a few of these eye hydrating compresses. I hope you had your uh, school ears on so you, you were retaining the, uh, the facts that I was trying to relay out to you. Yes, sir. Appreciate your presentation. Praise God. Uh, I have a little bit of, qu I have two questions. One of them is on supplements. Okay. But before I say that, I, I take a smoothie every morning with kale. Very good. I, I think that's wonderful. I think that's fruit. better than any pill that you can take. Eight ounce fruity every morning, smoothie. Very good. Excellent. Secondly, that's wonderful. I'm a very unique human being. My most fam my most favorite food of all is spinach. It's spinach. And that's I great. Eat, I eat a lot of spinach. <laughs> very healthy. But my question to you, in addition to that, it's best to have it raw. Every morning, I take a lutein tablet with my vitamin supplements. 
Am I wasting my money or should I, should I continue doing you that? You know, if you're taking all of those greens, which has got spinach and kale in it, you're probably getting lots of lutein that way. I even take the, the one for seniors, which I think is five. Uh, uh, so yeah, like Vitalux has one that's like got five milligrams in there, and then they usually say take two, you get your ten. You can't even buy lutein separately. Um, but I mean, if you're, if you're taking all those smoothies that's got all that green stuff in it, I think you're, you're ahead of the game. Doing that and then just exercising, you're doing the best things that you can do for it. My serious Re Remember this. I wanted to say one more little thing about health and healthful eating. The deeper the color of the fruit or the vegetable, the higher the antioxidant power. So bilberry, blueberry, they also add those usually to those supplements because they have very high antioxidant powers which help to quench the free radicals, which the free radicals cause an imbalance in the tissue, in the cells, both electrically and chemically, they cause imbalance. And they want to be quenched. And antioxidants, which are in the deep colored fruits and vegetables, quench those free radicals. I have a serious question. For about 40 years, there's no rational timing to it. All of a sudden I'll have something in my eye where it'll look like a rainbow and it'll stay there for several minutes mm -hmm. and go away. It's been probably 40 years I've been having that and then it, it, it may be once a month, it may be once every two or three. Is there any problem with that? Yeah, n no, probably not. Um, that sounds like almost like an ocular migraine where a vision, person will get like a visual aura Sometimes they're very short, um, and it's just almost like a migraine. But they sometimes don't get a headache afterwards. No major problem. I don't have headaches. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't sound like a problem. I haven't had a headache for 21 years. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Can you reverse wet macular? I have it in the right eye, but not the left. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I mean, you know, God can do anything, but once this tissue you know, gets damaged, and sometimes with wet macular degeneration we'll see something similar to this. Once this tissue is like damaged or gone, I mean it's gone. And the macula, remember I said the macula is a very small part of your retina. And um, you know, I would keep doing what you can, I like we've the, talked about. I take the eye vitamins that are Yeah, the eye vitamins. Yeah. I mean, that's about all they can offer you and then they do the injections mm -hmm. but you know they don't always work and they're just trying to preserve what you've got and if your vision is dramatically compromised then you gotta wonder why you're doing it. So my it can be helpful. I have seen it where the fluid does come down if the case of macular degeneration is not that bad um, but you know to see it reverse if, depending on how far advanced, if the tissue is like really damaged it ain't coming back unless you're looking at a divine miracle which I absolutely believe in um, but if the tissue's gone and like he heavily damaged, it's, it's tough. So my diet and the spinach and kale wouldn't necessarily help. No, but you also want to preserve the vision in the other eye because yes. that's what you're relying on now right. to see detail. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Pray that that doesn't happen to the other eye. Mrs. Putt, there's a lady behind you there with the hat. And there's this one. Here, you go first. When you said that you, you, when you have the glaucoma, most people don't even know when they have it. They, 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 that might happen, yeah. But how would you know if you do have it? Right. So <clears throat> once it gets to the point where it's like, hey, I'm not seeing properly, you're almost at the end. It's, it's a, because it, once you go down the hill, the roller coaster of glaucoma, like once you go down the hill, once you get started going down that hill, it's very hard to stop. It's like a roller coaster. Like it's hard to stop it, and then the degeneration will happen quickly. When, once you get to a point where I am not seeing properly due to glaucoma, you, you, you're going down that hill pretty far already. Do your eye bul bulge like you feel no. like your eyes? No, no, ain't gonna bulge. The only way to pick that up is actually to go see the doctor. That's why it's important yeah. to get it checked on a regular basis. If you're going like every year or every other year, that's fine. They should pick it up. But at the early stages, you won't know you have it until you come in and get your eyes checked. Because well, you can't measure the pressure had, in your eye. I had, he can see the white in one of my eyes. But if you're, if you have scheduled for, for cataract surgery, is there any way to avoid that? So cataracts are totally different than glaucoma, right? Um, remember cataract, 
is there. That's, that's when the lens gets cloudy. And we're looking at the back of the eye with this... Uh, sorry, I did glaucoma first. Yeah, the back of the eye. That's the back of the eye where, the, where there's glaucoma damage here. This is a cataract that's at the front of the eye. In terms of answering your question, is there anything you can do to avoid that? <coughs> At this time, I'm not aware of anything that you can do. But I will say this. The, remember I said that antioxidants fight free radical damage. So in terms of the, the metabolism of the lens, one of the things that, helps, that the lens has to help fight free radical damage is vitamin C. So vitamin C might be something that you can take to help prevent this from getting worse. Well, this is, this is advanced. This person needs to have it done because they can't see. I mean, when it gets to a point when it's like, you know, you're going to lose your driver's license, you should probably get cataract surgery done so you can operate properly. Um, once the vision in, in Ontario, once it gets to worse than 2050, in both eyes, they're going to yank your driver's license. And for good reason. You shouldn't be operating a heavy vehicle if you can't see properly. So if it gets advanced, you need to get it done if you want to see. But sometimes, People get rushed off for surgery and maybe things aren't that bad. Um, but I would still say, make sure you're getting lots of you know, vitamin C in your diet. Again, going back to a plant-based diet, getting it raw. That's, that's one of the best things you can do. You can take vitamin C supplementation. I can't say that it's going to you know, stop your cataract, but I do know that vitamin C is the, one of the antioxidants that the lens has to help fight against oxidative damage. Do you have a, a, an amount for that vitamin? I don't have an amount. No, I and can't. And is it reversible? If you Cataracts? Have, if you have like I, a I don't three, see it really reverse. A three or I don't four. see it really reverse. I, yeah. Okay, I have a question. And uh, I look in my eyes and I see like a white just around the, the yep. outer ring. Just so you're little, saying there's a white ring right around here? Just a little... Right around here, right? White little yep. ring. What this is, is called Arcus senilis. Okay. Um, Arcus, because it's a ring. Senilis, because it happens to you when you get older. It's a cholesterol deposit. Okay. If you're over the age of 40 and you have this cholesterol deposit, it doesn't really mean much. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Now, if you're under 40 and you got that cholesterol deposit in your cornea, get your blood cholesterol checked just to make sure you're okay there. That can be a sign of elevated cholesterol. But if you're over 40, it doesn't really mean much. Not a problem. Yes, we, have a, we have two more questions over here. Uh, in the kitchen, uh, if I chop the onions, is the burning ses sensation from the chopped onions good or bad for the eyes? Well, I think it's, it's irritating the eyes. And maybe your eyes need cleaning out. Maybe it's good for them to have some extra tears there. It's not really a problem. I, can't remember the name of the chemical that causes that. It's not a problem. I mean, you wouldn't want to put it in your eye because that could irritate your cornea for sure. Um, but you know, our eyes are sensitive organs and they're wonderfully made and so God put protection in them. That's why you got eyelids, right? And they're fast, right? Every, anybody have something coming at their eyes and it's like they blink on reflex faster than you can like intentionally blink? Thank God. <laughs> That's probably saved your cornea. <clears throat> Uh, I lost uh, about 80% of my sight to a glaucoma and the doctor, not to get too technical, but he says the canal of slim got plugged up with debris okay. and it caused the ocular pressure to yep. hit so that it rubbed on the optic nerve. My question is, in Canada, are they doing any study with the regeneration of adult stem cell regeneration because they're doing a lot of studies with a zebrafish that can regenerate its sight when it's damaged and they're, tra and they're doing studies to see that this may be able to regenerate the optic nerve. I, I know that they have used, um, you know, from the umbilical cord, they're trying to do stem cell research on that. Um, I think that's still a ways off. I think that's still a ways off. But I know they're doing research, not just in Canada, all around the world. They're doing research. You know, there's, there's lots of people who are working on this, smart people. Um, maybe. But you know, 
the Lord's coming is soon, so I don't know how, you know, how far down that road they're going to get. But yeah, they're working on it. And you know, you know, sometimes the doctors can... I have, I have a, in Kingston, we have a, an eye surgeon who's retired now. And you know, some of the stories that he's told me about how they could save vision from what looks like a devastated eye, sometimes they can end up with amazing sight afterwards. So those doctors, they work hard to, you know, to fix the problems, but they can't fix everything. Like once you lose the tissue, it's really hard. And I think there's still a lot of research that has to be done to try and do that, even using animal sources. Yes, um, so I had a detached retina Okay. And I had more, like several surgeries, which then on my left eye led to glaucoma. It happens. Um, yeah. And so it, now it's, the glaucoma is uncontrolled. Now, just recently on September, like, I, I know the exact date, September 18th, my right eye started seeing floaters. So I have um, went to my ophthalmologist who basically said that um, it's a sign of the vitreous separating. Yep, the vitreous detachment. We talked about so that. So, yeah. at that at but the time of their appointment, it, they said that there was no detachment or tear. So, my question would be: Is there anything that I can do to prevent the, a detachment or, um, you know? I'm not aware of anything that you can do specifically, just aside from following the health message and doing okay. exercise, the good blood, blood circulation to everywhere in the body. Okay. Um, yeah, it, that's, that, that's really hard. But, I mean, it's good that the gel has pulled away, that tension has been released. Because sometimes when the gel pulls away from the retina, it can cause a retinal tear detachment. And you've had it in the other eye, so you're at a higher risk for, once you have that, and you have a high amount of nearsightedness, I remember yeah, I said I'm that. very myopic. Yeah, yeah, very myopic. It leaves you at a higher risk, because t typically the peripheral retina then tends to be a little bit thinner. Um, so out here, this is the central retina, but out here in the periphery, it tends to be thinner mm -hmm. if the eye is a little bit longer. Remember we saw the picture of longer eye here? So just think, if you have this eye that's longer, the retina kind of gets stretched a little bit. And so it gets thinned out here. So you're more at risk for retinal tear detachment in these parts of the eye. Okay. That's right. Okay. So pray that you don't have another one. <laughs> I'm praying every day. But if you ever see flashes of light or a veil coming across, get it checked right away. Yeah, but if it changes dramatically, then you've got to get it checked. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for everything. Um, sure. One thing is like, Cutting back on the meats and pretty much trying to go vegan diet. Yeah, good for you. Um, the eyes have gotten blur, or my distance vision has gotten worse. I wear contacts for distance. Is that possible that diet's starting to correct? I don't think so. I don't. I, I mean, it, it's good to go on a plant-based diet. I highly right. suggest that for everybody. Um, <clears throat> but. Remember I said, this kind of goes back to the other question that was asked, and like, so the eye is working on optics. So everything has to obey the laws of physics when it comes to like focusing on the back of the eye. Now, you know, when you're at this point in life, sometimes people are farsighted. I don't know what, what you're, you know, if you're farsighted or you're nearsighted, but nearsighted. people tend to get more farsighted. So they, they tend that they need a little bit more help. Now, if you're becoming more nearsighted, that would be a little bit atypical at your age, but sometimes cataracts can start to form and will make you more nearsighted. So I don't know like what your which way your prescription is going that your vision's getting worse. But it's very typical. I see when people start to get in their 50s and later between their 50s and like 65, I see that people tend to become less nearsighted or more farsighted. But changes seem to come. Even within a year or two you can have changes. And you just need to get your eyes checked right. and maybe you just need a tweaking of the prescription. Right. So I would just kind of go get it checked. You know, just to tweak it. Just to, you know, check and make sure that everything is okay there. Okay, but not necessarily related just because of diet change. I've not really seen that. Right. Um, another question is um, for a friend struggling with smoking. How bad is the smoking in all aspects of the eye? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, for sure, smoking increases your risk of cataracts. For sure. A lot of times when I see younger people with cataracts, and when I say younger with cataracts, I'm talking people in their late 50s, early 60s who are developing cataracts. A lot of the time, smokers. So for sure, smoking increases your risk for cataracts. It also, I think they're trying to scare people a little bit, but they say it's between four to six times you're increasing your risk for macular degeneration. Think about it. You're putting into your body free radicals, smoke 
there are free radicals. So you're putting all these toxins into your body. Many of them are free radicals. It's going into your blood. Your body has to deal with it. And so they say it increases your risk four to six times for macular degeneration. So when I see a smoker come in and they have macular degeneration, I'm like really telling them, listen man, you know, you're playing with your sight here by continuing to smoke. I mean, they've done already damage because they have an increased risk without a doubt. Uh, but absolutely, smoking, tell them to quit. Yeah, tell them to quit. Yes, ma'am. Last time I went to see my ophthalmologist, um, she remarked that my vision had got better. It happens. Well, what I had been doing, because my eyes are always irritated, I look like I'm drunk all the time. So, <laughs> so what I started doing is um, doing very warm cloth compresses to my eyes. Followed, I know, I saw that. Yep. Followed by um, cold cold pads. Okay, cold pads. For a couple of minutes. You know, and then you said something like that about, about that thing. Is that likely to have done that? Improved my vision? She okay, had, that's a good question. Me, she gave me another prescription, but I didn't fill it. Yeah, so here's the story. <clears throat> Remember, our eyes are living tissues, okay? They're not like a camera here. You can just clean the lens, right? Yeah. But if your lens, or if the cornea, it's a living tissue. If it has problems, mm -hmm. the optical quality will be decreased. So, if you have dry eyes, let's go to the picture here of the eye. Here we go. So, here's a picture of the eye, the cornea. Now, just think, if you have dry eyes, the surface of the cornea is compromised. It's not nice and smooth like it should be. Okay? You know, what makes the eye white at the side is the same material that makes the eye clear. It's collagen, predominantly, okay? But the arraignment of the collagen is so precise and so uniform, that's what makes the tissue clear. But if the surface of the cornea is compromised because it's dry, and the surface is not nice and smooth because the tears aren't nourishing the cornea properly, well, it's like scraping the lens on your camera. The image is going to be a bit blurry. So now you treat the dry eye problem, you fix the surface of the cornea because you're lubricating your eye, you're doing the warm compresses, the surface of that clear tissue is in better shape. And what's in better shape? You see better because the optical quality is better. I've seen that with patients. I send them for cataract surgery, the surgeon puts them on dry eye things and their vision gets better. B good enough that they don't have to yet go for surgery by simply because they lubricated their eyes and made sure the surface of the cornea was in good shape. So the reason why their vision was down wasn't just because of the cataract but was also because they had dry eyes. It was a, com a compound problem. Once they treated the dry eyes, they were seeing well enough they didn't have to have cataract surgery. Now that's not always the case, but that, was the, that, that is the case sometimes. So if you got cataract, and you're, there's a question about, you know, can we fix the cataract? Uh, that's pretty hard, but you can make sure the surface of your cornea is in good shape. Yes, ma'am, in the yellow. Thank you. I also was wondering if sleeping under the overhead fan um, could cause dry eyes to... <coughs> Yeah, so the, pro yeah, the problem is, is that sometimes when people are sleeping, their eyelids aren't completely closed. And so if you have like a little bit of a crack opening, and you have the fan blowing, and even if you don't have the fan blowing, it can dry out the cornea, and that can lead to problems. Even scarring in some cases. So yeah, it's probably not a good idea to have it blowing on your face. And I know that's a bit of a problem with people who have sleep apnea and have masks on. Sometimes the air is blowing at the eye and could dry out the eye. And um, you might want to lubricate your eyes in the morning if they're particularly dry just to make sure that, because if the corneal surface gets too dry, it can scar, and if it gets scarred, it can impair your vision. What I don't see that too often, but it can happen. What, um, since we the eye, what should we do? What is good to lubricate the eye? Right, so if you ask me afterwards, I can tell you the names oh. of some lubricants. Yeah, I don't want to like tout a particular company, but there are some good, good quality tears out there, but not Visine, that, that, ain't, that ain't for dry eye problems. That's for druggies. <laughs> yes. <Sorry. laughs> My simple question is, how often should one use the warm compress today? Uh, you can use them two, two times a day, three times if you're really having dry eye problems. But yeah, for people with real dry eye problems, I tell them twice a day. I prescribe it. You need to do it. Yeah, for sure. 
Also, being in the sunshine state, sunglasses would help to delay aging process? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's one of the things that causes aging is ultraviolet radiation, absolutely. So, you know, a hat and sunglasses, for sure. Um, for people, for example, who live in the Caribbean, you are not that far from the Caribbean, the sun is intense. It can get quite intense here. And sun damage, <coughs> if you ever see people from the Caribbean, almost it happens to everybody, the white of the eye will get thicker. It's called a penguecula. And then it grows onto the cornea. And then it's called a pterygium. And if it gets too far, they have to scrape it back. They do surgery. But in those cases, it's related to having dry eyes. So you want to lubricate well. And block the sun. We do, yeah, cut down on that ultraviolet radiation. It's leading to some of those problems. Very good question. Very appropriate for where we are. We do see it in Canada, but not near as common as it is down here or in the Caribbean. Or equatorial countries. Do you have any hints for delaying the progression of floaters? That's a tough one. Not really. Make sure you drink lots of water so you're well hydrated so you don't run into a vitreous detachment. I mean, they come anyways once you get into your 50s. Um, not really. Because floaters can be different things. Usually they are um, collagen in the gel of the eye. <coughs> Any more burning questions before we do the quiz? <laughs> all right. I think that's all the questions. All right. So here's the quiz. I got four of these eye hydrating compresses. And like I said, if you have dry eyes, which is very common, you know, doing ocular lubrication using quality non-preserved drops really makes a difference. And doing the warm compresses can really make a difference. Okay? So, um, even if you don't get, win one of these, you can get them at the drugstore. I'm pretty sure this company is called Bruder. They're, uh, they're based in Atlanta. And um, there's other companies that make them. I've sold other companies' products as well. And basically, you, 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 this one you microwave for like uh, 15 to 20 seconds. Make sure it's not too hot. And you put it right over top of your closed eyes for about 5 to 10 minutes. You can, you know... Microwave a potato, make, you know, make sure it's not too hot and cover it with a cloth and do the same. But just don't push on your eyes, don't sleep with it, because if you compress your cornea, it'll change your prescription and blur you up. All right, let's see if I can remember or think of some questions here. And uh, just while you're thinking, uh, if you could, uh, if you don't mind, if you could, um, if you didn't fill out your form, Put your name on it. If you're interested in any of the types of programs that we offer, uh, you can check that off and we'll make sure you're notified. Put your email address on there because we send out an email with uh, the list of what we're doing uh, on a regular... We're going to be starting kicking into our programs. We're going to do a plant-based cooking school uh, in the new year, probably the beginning of February, and that will be an eight-week program. Uh, it's going to be really, really good. We're going to do another program prior to that. Uh, Denise, when is that... Uh, the plant-wise program going to be? Is that in January? Middle of January and end of November. It's a film that uh, it's uh, end of December. Yeah, so we'll be letting you know if you're interested. It's going to it's a film on plant plant uh, plant based lifestyle and which is what uh, the doctor has been talking about. Perfect circulation. A uh, very wise person said perfect circulation brings perfect health. And so circulation is very vital. And so the closer you move towards a natural plant-based diet, which you find in Genesis 129, nuts, grains, fruits, and vegetables, uh, that's the simplest, the, the healthiest diet. And we're going to show you how to make really tasty food, but there's lots of... Uh, Lots of things you can go on on YouTube and just look for plant-based uh, cooking, and uh, there's lots and lots of good recipes there as well. So anyway, fill out your registration card. Does anyone have one ready to be picked up? Any? Everyone filled them out? Okay. So we're going to get, do a little draw right now, and uh, so now you're working on your your students. You're going to see how much they retained. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. So we'll wait. We'll, we'll, we'll do that and then we'll give up some books. All right. <clears throat> now, who can tell me what is the dioptric power, more or less, of... No, wait, wait, let me finish the question. <laughs> Eager students, I love it. 
Who can tell me the dioptric power of the cornea? Let's see, right here. 45 diopters is right. She got it first. We'll Thank run. you, Pastor. Okay. All right. Very good. It was 45 diopters. You were paying very good attention. It was 60 for the whole eye. The other gentleman over here, he remembered that, which is very good. And it, So the whole eye is 60, but the cornea is roughly 45. And we have a machine that measures the curvature of the cornea, which also is the dioptric power, which is called a keratometer. Okay. Uh, next question. What is it called when... And I want to see a hand for this, you know, so we get the right person here. What is it called when you get the hardening of the lens that leads to the inability to focus up close? Yes, ma'am. With the red dress, red and white. Cataract? No, that's not a cataract. The cataract is when it becomes opacified or cloudy. It, we're dealing with the right um, thing here. But what is it? It's a tricky one. Sorry? Uh, it's, it's going to be the first one. Yeah. Shout it out. This Shout gentleman out. here at the front with the tie. It's called presbyopia. Yes, presbyopia is what happens in your 40s typically, and it continues on until the. Uh, so who's who's getting it? This gentleman here at the front with the suit. Okay, very good, Hubert. All oh, right, Hubert. we got two more left. Let's see. I'm thinking of a question here. What part of the eye is responsible for having the ability to read or have fine detail? This lady with the pink dress? Yeah. It is the macula. That is right. Excellent. I did hear the right answer elsewhere, but I've only got a few of these. So it was the lady with the pinky red dress. You all deserve one. You all just, yeah, you guys are doing really good. You guys are definitely paying attention, I, as I'm hearing by the answers. That's very good. Okay, I got one more left. Perfect. And for those of you who do win this, please read the instructions on how to do it. Remember I said it's like 15, 20 seconds in the microwave. It heats up. Make sure it's not too hot. You put it over top of your closed eyes for about 5 to 10 minutes. And if you don't win one today, you can go and purchase one. You can do the thing with the potato. These are nice and easy and sometimes you need things to be easy in order to facilitate for you to do it. You know, if you have to go and get the potato and, you know, wash it and then micro... Like, this is easy, quick and easy, and if you really want to solve this problem, they are really helpful. And that's been my experience. Yes, sir? Are they reusable? They are reusable. Usually, I think it says in there, they're usually good for about six months. Uh, but yes, they are completely reusable. I would say use it every day. If you've got dry eye problems, definitely do it. Okay, last question. What can I do here? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a tricky one, but you guys were paying attention. How many of the cranial nerves are used in some form with the eye? <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, very good. But I heard too many, and I didn't see a hand that was that was. Uh <laughs> okay, let's let's try it on. We need to see a hand, though. Um, okay, watch for a hand. We got to get a hand on this one. Speak to the hand. Let me see. Stand up. Don't just put your hand up. Stand up. Okay, for the last one here. If you have the answer, stand up. Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Who made the eye? Yes, Jesus. All right. How many eyes are there? How many eyes do we generally have? Excellent. That's not a... <laughs> well done. I'm asking the harder questions. He's just going to give the easy ones. <laughs> All right. Okay, you, I hope you guys are paying attention. Ultimately, why does vision become compromised, usually, why does vision become compromised in diabetics? Man with the Poor circulation, that's right. It's because of poor circulation that... Um, she's got the sunglasses on top of her head. Because awesome. of poor circulation, the, 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 the body... 
any, most parts of the body of the eye, if they fail to work properly, you get swelling of the tissue. Let me give you another exa little example of that. Oh, I'm back. Did we go? Um, for example, there is a, uh, a disease called Fuchs dystrophy. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Fuchs dystrophy, corneal endothelial dystrophy. And so the inside layer of the cornea, due to a genetic reason, it's a genetic di um, dystrophy, the inside layer of the cornea stops working properly. The inside layer of the cornea, called the endothelium, oh, here's the eye back, The endothelium, which is the inside layer of the cornea, pumps water out of the cornea. The technical term for that is called detergescence. Okay, it's like a technical term for pumping water out of the cornea. If it doesn't happen, then the cornea will swell. When the cornea swells, remember I talked about those collagen fibers, they're not lined up properly. And when they're not lined up properly, the cornea will turn white or very hazy and your vision will be impaired because if it's hazy, you can't see through it. And so the cornea, any tissue in the eye, really, when it's not working properly, you start to get swelling. And so with diabetes, that's definitely the problem. If you get swelling in the tissue, uh, the tissue doesn't work properly, your vision's going to get compromised. So if you get swelling in the macula, that was the, um, the last one. You can see this is all fluid here in the macula. This is called macular edema, cystoid macular edema that comes with diabetic retinopathy. And it comes with other things as well. Um, so that's, that's correct. So we don't get proper circulation. The, the fluid can't get pumped properly. The fluid coming in, it comes in and it gets stuck there and it can't get back out, so to speak. And then you get swelling in the tissue. So I think that concludes the, my part of the program. And I hope you, you learned something. And if you have any other questions, just see me afterwards and I'll try and answer them. Okay, we're going to give a few, uh, few gifts away. But yes, thank you. I'm, I'm going to put in for a transfer of his, his, uh, his uh, residence to Umatilla, Florida. What do you say? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. We're going to give some books away. This is a cookbook, a plant-based cookbook called Of These You May Freely Eat. It's really good. It's, been, uh, it's a classic uh, cookbook and it's delicious food. Uh, where are they? Where are, where's the bin of names for registration? Denise, do you have that bin that we want to collect? If you could draw, if you could just draw a name as you're walking along, we want to give some books away. Pastor? Yes. Can we just buy those books? Uh, you can buy them at the Adventist Book Center for around five bucks. Oh, we can't get them in up here? No, I don't, we don't do business here. No, I ain't. We're a non-profit. <laughs> no. Well, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get you fixed up if you'd like one. And there's other, yes. Okay, so who do we have? Maybe you're going to win one. Ruth Pardon? Ruth Lucas. Ru okay, you, you have your microphone? Ruth Lucas. Ru Ruth Lu Lucas. Uh, Lucas. Miss Lucas. There we go. Who would like to be a book runner? I would. Okay, great. And as you're walking, uh, we haven't got three hands. You can't, you can't collect the next one? Okay. Let's see how we do here. Excellent. Okay, great. The next book, so here we go. Donna Arlick. There she is. Thank you, Leanna. There we go. Eris. Eris, okay, perfect, Eris. Uh, you're getting, okay, one last cookbook and then we've got other books to give you. We have some magazines. That have lots of recipes in them. Barbara Mathers? Barbara. Barbara. Did Barbara leave? Let's move on to the next. Robert Jones. Robert Jones. Who sits right beside you. You must have been watching, looking at his. Uh, okay, perfect. So, Robert, excellent. And now we're going to, this is a, a fifth, let's see, this one here is a, uh, a beginner's guide to plant-based diet. And there's 55 delicious plant-based recipes in this book called Vibrant Life. So we have five of those to give you. Did you, did you, did you get a, you don't have one? This one was for Barbara. Oh, Barbara, Barbara we, we're not, we can't get it to her. So let's do another one for cookbook. Okay. Let's give this one to Hubert. He wanted one. Okay. 
You want it. Richard and the last name starts with an A. Richard. Richard A. Aiken. Richard Aiken, are you here? Oh yeah, that could be. He just left. It looks like they just left. He just left. We'll we'll make sure we get him one. Uh, Larie Clark. Larie Clark left. We'll get her. We can. We'll get her one. And cassette. Uh, cassette left. Okay, those three left. Because that's back. Oh, bless your heart. Uh, then, oh yeah. Uh, cassette, why don't you bring one to Lurie? And who else was the other one? Oh, Richard. Yeah, we'll get one for Richard. Um, Vernie Benson, maybe? Vernie, are you still here? Miss Vernie, she was here earlier. Oh, this is a different, that's a different book. Actually, that's not a cookbook. That's, called, that's okay. We're fine. Um, this is called Amazing Health. It's a really good book. Eight Principles of uh, Health. Madriana or Madriana? Okay. Excellent. Um, Beverly Calder. Beverly just left with Mary. Thank you. Mary Russell. Mary left. Mary is 98. That's the cookbook, Vibrant Life. And Lawrence, are you here? There we are. Excellent. Sylvan Lawrence. Sylvan. <laughs> Congratulations to both of you. If you don't, if you, if you are in the same household, maybe you don't need a second one. But maybe you've got a good friend who you could share it with. Yeah. Yeah, share with a friend. You won. It's who am I to tell you what to do with your gift? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's Betty, I think. She was with Mary. Oh, yeah. Uh, Stephen or Stephen Paul? Stephen. Are you still here? Stephen, there he is. I think if you leave, you pretty well. There's Bill. He's okay. He's in Perry Sweatman. Perry was here. There he is. Excellent. Couple more left. Shireen Smith. Shireen, there we go. Lots of great recipes in this magazine. Tamara or Tamara Woolley. Tamara, in the back with her mom. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Now, how many people are disappointed oh. <laughs> that you didn't get anything? <laughs> I called out too many names. Did you? Yeah, she doesn't have another one. Oh, okay, uh, I'll get one for you. Don't go away. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, the, the, yes, thank you very much, Denise and Leanna. Appreciate it a lot. Okay, um, there was, uh, there's a book here called Ministry of Healing. It's a health book, and it, a lot of the principles that were talked about today are in this book. Uh, you'll find it very interesting. I put a bunch of them out on the, on the counter going out. And also there's a, that health program, I don't know if I talked about it, uh, and uh, next uh, Saturday did I talk about that? Yes. The beginning? Yeah, there's a flyers are out on the counter there if anyone's interested. So I think we're good. I think we're good to go. Uh, so let's have prayer. We'll pray for the doctor and his family is they're going to be heading back to Canada uh, in the near future. 
so we're delighted that you're here. Let's, let's have prayer for these dear ones and why don't we stand together. Thank you all for coming. It was a delight. We found it extremely interesting. I had one little question. How come, what's, how come we have different colors of eyes? Is there a better color, a worse color? Does it matter? What, what's that all about? Just God likes variety? I think God likes variety. Um, yeah, I think, you know, your eye color is determined by your genetics. Okay. Unless you've got some kind of eye disease, it can change the color of your eyes. Some, okay. Yeah, sympathetic innervation changes can cause eye color change. But um, I think God just likes variety. Mm -hmm. And they follow a very specific, you know, inheritance pattern. Like you've got dominant and non-dominant. Right. It'll affect brown versus blue. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just God's putting variety in. Yeah, like he loves different colors of flowers too, so doesn't he? There's so much variety in facial features, there's so yeah. much variety in like structures of bodies. Yeah. Eye color is just another one of them. Yes, amen. Why don't you have a prayer for us? Oh, I'll have sure. a prayer for you and then you pray for us. All right. And uh, especially for all these dear souls that uh, are here today. Yeah. Okay, I'll start. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this, for Dr. Minder. Thank you, Lord, for his offer to come and speak and he's been just a huge blessing. We've learned a lot of things that we didn't know we even needed to know uh, about our eyes, which makes a lot of sense. Thank you for being a God of love, a God of order, a God of kindness and forgiveness and new beginnings. And so, Lord, help us to do our very best to take care of our eyes. And you said the eyes are the window of the soul. And, Lord, help us to remember our soul as well, to, to be prepared spiritually and to get to know you better uh, every day so that when you come in the clouds of glory, when Jesus, you send your son to, to rescue your children, no matter what eye problems we may be having now, Lord, you are going to, uh, they will have perfect vision and perfect eyesight for eternity. We look forward to that day. In the meantime, help us to take good care of ourselves, especially our eyes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dearly Father, we thank you, Lord, for... Um we were able to come here on the Sabbath and able to worship you and now to learn more about your amazing creation that you put in us, in our eyes. And we just thank you for that, for all the blessings that we have and the blessing of sight. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you'll be with this congregation as they move forward, Lord. And I'm just so thankful to see that they, they're very health focused because you are a God of compassion and you have sent us the health message that we could share with others because you don't want us to see, in, you don't want to see us in poor health. You want to see us in good health. Um, and you've said that several times in your word. So I pray, Lord, you'll be with this congregation and bless them, especially as they are studying and learning about uh, plant-based diet and uh, healthful living and the, and the right arm of the gospel, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, as they continue down that road, you will continue to bless them, that they will continue to be a beacon here on a hill uh, in Florida. So I pray, Lord, you will bless them in the work that is being done here. And each one, Lord, that they will uh, be in good health as they follow your health message. Mm -hmm. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And go with the Minder family, Lord. Please keep them, take them home safely and continue to bless his work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, there may be people here who are not Seventh-day Adventists who wonder, what's this health message all about? What are you talking about, the health message? We have the health message. Uh, this, this little book here uh, goes into some details about the health message message. This little book called Minutes of Healing. It's a very spiritual book, but it also goes into the health aspect. Thank you, Dr. Minder. We've really enjoyed your time here. Let's give him another hand. We appreciate you very much. Thank you all for coming. Good to see you again.